After a week off, Congress is back today and is scheduling a vote for Speaker at 9 a.m. this morning. Tuesday night, the Republican caucus held a candidates forum where the two leading candidates for Speaker, Majority Leader Steve Scalise and Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee Jim Jordan, they made their case for why they deserve 217 votes to become Speaker of the House. Now, remember, all it takes is five renegade Republicans, and they don't have a nominee to send down to the floor for a vote. Marjorie Taylor Greene came out of the meeting late Tuesday night and said neither one of them has 217 votes. Now, remember, the House is split with Republicans getting 221 votes, Democrats getting 212 Hakeem Jeffries, the House Minority Leader, Democrat, was not in that meeting. So Republicans are not doing any bipartisan outreach with many Republican members of the Problem Solvers Caucus no longer talking to Democratic members of the Problem Solvers Caucus because Democratic members of the Problem Solvers Caucus failed to come to McCarthy's rescue during last Tuesday's vote. In order to get some business done... Republicans tomorrow or later today or tomorrow may decide to elect Patrick McHenry, who is currently the acting speaker pro tem. They may decide to elect him a full speaker pro tem, which would give him some maneuverability to get to work on a budget. But he is anything but a leader. That's why Kevin McCarthy named him as his replacement if they ever voted to vacate the chair. He didn't want anybody who wanted the chair. He wanted to come back. So he got an ineffectual, meek, obsequious Patrick McHenry to be his acting speaker pro tem. So there's going to be a secret vote later today at 9 a.m. Chances are nobody's getting 217 votes. But someone will end up with a majority. It's either going to be Steve Scalise or Jim Jordan who ends up with a majority. That's not 217 votes. And remember, the Republicans have kind of made a promise that they wouldn't bring a vote for Speaker to the floor unless they knew they had 217 votes because they don't want a repeat of what happened in January when it took 15 rounds for McCarthy to become Speaker. So... Somebody's going to get a majority later today. They won't get 217 votes, but Scalise or Jordan, one of them gets a majority. And the question is, would the candidate who falls short of that majority, would that candidate be willing to throw his support behind the one who got the majority? So far, neither Steve Scalise or Jim Jordan indicate that they would. But that is their way out of this. Eventually, they're going to have to go with who wins the majority of the caucus, not who has 217 votes. Divide 200 and whatever. Uh, Looming over Tuesday night's meeting of the Republican caucus was Donald Trump, who has endorsed Jim Jordan. Ken Buck, Congressman Ken Buck, one of Two members of the Freedom Caucus who voted to certify the election for Joe Biden immediately after the insurrection. Remember, right after the insurrection, when the smoke had cleared and everybody came back, the entire Freedom Caucus, except Chip Roy and Ken Buck, voted not to certify the election for Joe Biden. So during Tuesday night's candidate forum for speaker... Ken Buck raised his hand and he had a simple question. Did Donald Trump win the 2020 presidential election? Now, Ken Buck wanted an honest answer, but both Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan refused, refused to answer the question the same way they refused to vote to certify the election for Joe Biden after January 6th. According to sources in the room, Scalise and Jordan both refused to say that Donald Trump 
lost the 2020 presidential election. 130 Republicans in the House, including then Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, voted to refuse to certify the election for Joe Biden after the insurrection. And the fact that both candidates for Speaker Tuesday night refused to disentangle themselves or the party from Trump speaks volumes to what the Republicans have turned into. It is a party of tough-talking cowards who refuse to stand up to the man who goes against everything they stand for. Donald Trump has been found to be a rapist. The judge said as much. He's not even close to being a billionaire. We don't even know, we don't even know if he has any cash. He is a complete fraud, a charlatan, and everyone in this Republican caucus knows that. But while they're so busy talking tough, saying, let's go into Iran, drop some bombs, bring back the death penalty, very few of them, especially the two candidates for speaker, have the courage to call Donald Trump what he is, a fraud. This is exactly how parties get destroyed, and sometimes nations. I'll have more on this later on in the show. But first, I have a correction. On yesterday's show, I presented a video of members of the Iranian parliament cheering and breaking into chants of death to America upon hearing news that Hamas soldiers in Gaza had broken into Israel proper and begun massacring hundreds of citizens. I was wrong. The video in question is more than three years old and dates back to January of 2020 when Donald Trump ordered a missile strike, assassinating one of Iran's most beloved military figures, General Qasem Soleimani. For some reason, the video ended up in one of my feeds, a feed that I consider reliable, but obviously it isn't. Much like right after 9-11, there are people itching to bomb countries that had nothing to do with the tragedy at hand. Parliament, the Iranian parliament, was not screaming death to America over the weekend. I apologize. I fell prey to misinformation. Republican candidates are blaming the Biden administration for freezing up nearly $6 billion, uh, for, for unfreezing nearly $6 billion in frozen Iranian assets that have been kept in South Korea. The Republicans charged that releasing this money gave Iran the working capital it needed to fund Hamas's attack on Israel. But Matthew Miller, a State Department spokesperson on Tuesday, reiterated what all our intelligence agencies have confirmed, and that is, despite reporting in the Wall Street Journal, there is no evidence that the Iranian government was behind this attack. Democratic Senators John Tester of Montana and, and Joe Manchin of West Virginia are conservative thorns in Joe Biden's side. On Tuesday, they said they were teaming up to introduce a resolution calling on the Biden administration to refreeze Iran's $6 billion, begging the question, if Iran used that $6 billion to fund the attack on Israel, then how can you refreeze it? It's been spent. Uh, Republicans maintain that Iran funded the attack on credit knowing they could pay for it later once the $6 billion was unfrozen. When asked if he would like to refreeze Iran's $6 billion, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell stared blankly into space until his colleagues ushered him away. Senator Tim Scott is a Republican candidate for president. He's making the rounds, insisting Joe Biden is more to blame for the attack on Israel than Hamas is. Scott said that when Biden agreed to unfreeze the Iranian assets for a swap of prisoners, he sent a message that we negotiate with terrorists and that opened the door wide open for Hamas to invade Israel. Here is Senator Tim Scott on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, who asked Senator Scott 
about one of his more vicious tweets this week attacking Joe Biden. Biden's weakness invited the attack. Biden's negotiation funded the attack. Biden administration wanted Israel to stand down after the attack. At this point, Biden is complicit. Kind of rough. More of Tim Scott and Wolf Blitzer. Senator, are you at all concerned that these sorts of charges undermine efforts to be united right now here in our country in support of Israel? Well, I think we should be, without question, totally and completely united behind Israel, period. We should, without question, be united behind Israel, period. United behind America, question mark. We should look back at the breadcrumbs that lead back to the hostage negotiation that freed $6 billion. And what did Tehran say about the $6 billion? We will use it in any way we like. Tehran is using the $6 billion any way they like, much the same way Tim Scott is using this tragedy any way he likes. This is incredibly reckless on Tim Scott's part. There is no evidence that Iran was behind this. And if there is, you need to tread quietly and try not to expand the conflict. If you want to be commander in chief, I best remind you that the primary role of a commander in chief is not to waste our soldiers on wars egged on by foolhardy, trigger happy chicken hawks. And by chicken hawks, I mean guys who never served in the military but love war, not the other kind of chicken hawk, which I'm in no way calling Tim Scott. I'm not calling Tim Scott the other kind of chicken hawk, even though he has yet to introduce us to that girlfriend he insists he has. Joe Biden went on national television Tuesday with the vice president and the secretary of state standing behind, behind him to confirm that Hamas killed 14 Americans over the weekend in Israel. Then he described a gruesome litany of assaults against the Israeli people. Parents butchered using their bodies to try to protect their children. Stomach turning reports of being babies being killed. Entire families slain. Young people massacred while attending a musical festival to celebrate peace. To celebrate peace. Women raped, assaulted, paraded as trophies. Families hid their fear for hours and hours, desperately trying to keep their children quiet to avoid drawing attention. We need to be careful here. I choose to read about this instead of watching the pictures or the videos on television. There's been something of an insistence by some that we bear witness to all these horrors that happened and are continuing to happen in Israel. I get that. But I worry the visuals border on terror porn and cloud our judgment. What are you glued to the television for? Are you glued for information or are you glued to the television so you can feel something? If you're watching the news to feel something, I strongly urge you to turn it off and pick up a book. At some point, the World Trade Center towers coming down in continuous loop on our television screens might not have served the national interest. It made us fearful, angry, sad, and therefore prone to George W. Bush's craven warmongering, cloaked in faux patriotism. In times of crisis, feelings are the enemy of truth and peace. The same way you don't have to have an opinion, a hot take on everything that happens in the news, you don't always have to feel something. You need information. Information can help you weigh the facts so you can be a responsible citizen. I strongly urge you to turn your television off and read about what's going on. That's my opinion. President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said on Tuesday that 20 Americans who were in Israel at the time are unaccounted for. President Biden told the American people that we now know that American citizens are among those being held hostage in Gaza by Hamas. It's hard to get an exact number, but the number of hostages in total could be as low as 100, maybe as high as 150. 
some of whom are reportedly grandmothers and babies. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is scrambling to restore a sense of order in an Israel where many citizens now complain that the state has let them down by allowing the attack and then not responding quickly enough afterwards. Much like George W. Bush, who completely blew it on 9-11 by ignoring intelligence reports, Netanyahu is talking tough, vowing to eliminate Hamas once and for all. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant declared late Tuesday night that Israel has, quote, released all constraints as hundreds of airstrikes raise Gaza neighborhoods. Four U.N. relief workers were reportedly killed in Gaza by Israeli airstrikes. Not exactly the kind of news Michael Herzog, Israel's ambassador to the United States, wanted to hear as he works the phones urging the international community to call on Hamas to release Israeli hostages. Israel has every right to defend itself, but indiscriminate bombing is only going to make it worse for the hostages, assuming they survive. President Biden and his Secretary of State show no sign of trying to bring Hamas to the negotiating table. Instead, on Tuesday, Joe Biden called Hamas's attack on Israel, quote, an act of sheer evil. Yes, it was. But Hamas does something equally evil, and that is they hide in mosques, hospitals, ambulances, and schools. So eliminating Hamas means collateral damage in Gaza that is simply unimaginable. Everyone has a role to play here. And I'm not sure Joe Biden's playing the right role. Netanyahu is playing the right role. He wants to seek revenge. But it is Joe Biden's role to convince Israel to think of the larger picture and try to save as many lives as possible. Of course, Israel is going to hit back. But it is Biden's responsibility to counsel temperance. This is what United States presidents used to do in similar situations. Again, it is hard not to want to seek revenge. And again, Israel has every right to defend itself and seek vengeance. I'm talking about America working to end the bloodshed, which I'm not quite hearing yet. Instead, I'm hearing full-throated support for Israel, which is good, but no calls for restraint. On Tuesday, Israeli soldiers say they found dozens of civilians, including babies, dead in the kibbutz of Kafar Azar. An atrocities uh, too despicable to imagine, soldiers say they saw heads completely chopped off and compared the scene to Nazi massacres of Jews inside Eastern Europe during World War II. President Biden spoke of these attacks and said, quote, like every nation in the world, Israel has the right to respond. Indeed, it has a duty to respond to these vicious attacks, unquote. A duty to respond to these vicious attacks. Now, everybody has a role to play. We can't blame Israel for doing what it's doing. That's what they do. But Joe Biden is the commander in chief of the most powerful army in the world, the most powerful army the world has ever known. And we here in America spend more on weapons than the rest of the world combined. In 10 seconds, Joe Biden could wipe Gaza and Hamas off the planet. They could turn it into glass in seconds, not with nuclear weapons. Our military could turn Gaza, just could pave Gaza in 10 seconds. Again, I understand why Israel has a duty to respond, but Joe Biden also has a duty to stop the killing. This won't end like World War II with Japan and Germany reduced to rubble. Gaza has already been reduced to rubble. The fighting won't end. This only seems intractable to Israel and the Palestinians because they can't see through the fire of hot rage in their eyes. That's why Joe Biden has to help. 
There was a time when American presidents stopped the fighting. Nixon, Carter, Clinton worked tirelessly to keep the peace, keep the dialogue going. But it all changed after 9-11, when America turned its back on the peace process in the Middle East. Israel was perceived as our global ally in the war on terror, and George W. Bush didn't believe in negotiating with terrorists. Hence, he wasn't interested in Yasser Arafat or the Palestinians. During the later years of the George W. Bush administration, elections were held inside Gaza, and Hamas won, beating out the more moderate Fatah party that still rules the West Bank. George W. Bush didn't like the fact that Hamas won an election, so he refused to recognize the results, all this while he was busy spreading democracy throughout the Middle East. Hamas is a terrorist organization. It's also a political party, as well as a social services agency, just like Hezbollah in Lebanon. Netanyahu can try to wipe out Hamas, but I don't think he can do it. And if he does, some other quasi-political party slash terrorist organization will take Hamas's place. Over the years, despite Netanyahu insisting he doesn't negotiate with terrorists, Israel has talked and negotiated with Hamas because Israel knows there are groups in Gaza that are even worse. So, like I said, I don't expect Israel to fix this, but America can. Obama, Trump, and Biden all had their own way of washing their hands of the situation in Israel by either giving Netanyahu whatever he wanted, like Trump, or like Biden and Obama, ignoring him. America does a lot of bad in this world. However, when you look at the Middle East, Iraq notwithstanding, it was America that brought peace between Israel and Syria. It was America that brought peace between Israel and Jordan. It was America that brought peace between Israel and Egypt. Permanent peace after decades of war. It is America that is bringing peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. From Jimmy Carter to Bill Clinton, America has succeeded in the Middle East when we rely not on weapons, but on diplomacy. One part of this puzzle remains the Palestinians. Again, mostly because of 9-11 and the war on terror, America has abandoned the peace effort and the Palestinians have been abandoned as well. We've convinced ourselves we're fighting terrorists, so we ignore the Palestinians. Well, by ignoring the Palestinians for more than 20 years, we helped create more terrorism, which is what the war on terrorism accomplished. It created more terrorists. You cannot bomb your way to peace. You can't send soldiers into Gaza and have them go door to door for peace. There's only one way to get lasting peace. It's the same way America secured lasting peace between Israel and Syria, lasting peace between Israel and Jordan, lasting peace between Israel and Egypt. One way, diplomacy and paying them billions of dollars in foreign aid not to fight. That also helps. You throw in a couple of billion dollars a year, suddenly they stop fighting. Israel's Iron Dome is has been built to knock incoming missiles out of the sky, and yet the missiles are still landing. Each anti-ballistic missile from Iron Dome costs about $40,000, and there's simply no way the Israelis can shoot down the thousands of tiny rockets fired from Gaza. Israel says it's running low on munitions 
for Iron Dome. And on Tuesday, Biden promised to replenish their stockpile immediately. $40,000 per anti-ballistic missile. Imagine if you bought peace. Imagine imagine what $40,000 could buy in Gaza, could buy a lot of pacifism. One American aircraft carrier has been moved into the region. Jake Sullivan, America's national security advisor, said on Tuesday that Joe Biden might order in a second aircraft carrier. During a question and answer session at the White House, Sullivan said, quote, let me be clear, we did not move the carrier for Hamas. Gaza's population of nearly 2.5 million has been living under a 16-year blockade where both Israel and Egypt control the flow of food, fuel, water, and electricity. Somehow, weapons and missiles found their way in. Egypt, which has drawn much closer to Israel in the past several decades after years of war, assured Israel on Monday that they were not assisting Hamas in the flow of weapons into Gaza. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is in the air today and is expected to arrive in Israel on Thursday. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer was leading a delegation of lawmakers on a tour of China when fighting broke out in Israel. After meeting two days ago with China's top leader, Xi Jinping, Schumer said he was cutting short the rest of his fact-finding mission to head back to Washington so he could deal with a funding package for Israel. During a meeting with the Chinese leader, Schumer scolded Xi for not condemning Hamas's raid. Later, the Chinese government clarified that both the Palestinians and the Israelis are China's friends. That's what she said. That's what she said. How can Schumer and Biden manifest an aid package to Israel when there is no Speaker of the House? I touched on this earlier. All spending bills emerge from the House of Representatives. And even if Biden, McConnell, and Schumer cobble together a spending package, there's no speaker to bring it to the floor for a vote. There is an acting speaker, Patrick McHenry, but House rules demand that his role is ceremonial and the only power he has is to get a new speaker elected. But there's now talk of making him a acting full speaker pro tem. He said, McHenry, on Tuesday that there might be some wiggle room here. There might be political will inside the House to test the rules to see if they can get an aid package passed if the Republicans can't agree on a speaker later today. What do you think? You think a speaker is going to emerge later today? Be interesting. Again, you need 217 votes to become speaker, but the Republican caucus, the Republican caucus has 217 votes, but it's split between Jordan and Scalise. If they take a vote later today and one of them wins the majority, what are the chances that the loser will throw his support behind the winner of the majority and will you know, will eight Republicans, like last time, not go along? Impossible to say. Impossible to say. The president of Turkey, Recep Erdogan, warned Benjamin Netanyahu on Tuesday of disproportionate attacks against Hamas. Israel's official policy is disproportionate attacks. It is to make sure they inflict way more damage on those who attack them than what than that was done to them. Here is the latest as the war in the Middle East now enters its fifth day. Israel is warning Palestinians to leave Gaza through the border with Egypt. At least 900 Palestinians are reported dead as Israeli missiles pound Gaza. 260 children are reported to be among the dead. 4,500 Palestinians in Gaza have been wounded. 400,000 Palestinians living in Gaza are without adequate water, sanitation, or hygiene facilities. Palestinian Americans visiting Gaza, 
These are American citizens. They report that they have been abandoned by the Biden administration. The United Nations is now reporting that Israeli airstrikes inside Gaza have left 123 civilians without a home. We are now learning that four mosques inside Gaza's Shafti refugee camp have been struck. Those attending their daily prayers were killed, some crushed by toppling domes. Turkish President Erdogan announced late Tuesday that he has met with UN officials and spoke with the Secretary General in order to figure out a way to get humanitarian aid to the Palestinians. Israeli news services report that Hamas rockets have hit the Israeli city of Ashkelon. There is a new tranche of American weapons that arrived in Israel late Tuesday night. Some presumably include those anti-ballistic missiles for the Iron Dome. Hamas called President Biden's remarks on Tuesday in which he promised unlimited help for Israel. Hamas called that inflammatory. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the 33-year-old Democrat from the Bronx, condemned members of the Democratic Socialists of America, a party of which she is a member. AOC said the DSA's Sunday protest in New York in support of Hamas was filled with anti-Semitic chants of bigotry and callousness. She called for the DSA to put civilian lives, lives first on both sides and that the DSA should be demanding immediate ceasefire and de-escalation. It was kind of unnerving to see the DSA uh, staging a pro-war rally. This is the mop-up for October 11th, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. Leave a comment to let me know what you think or if you have a correction, subscribe to my channel and my newsletter. Again, we do not have a Speaker of the House. We may have one later today. Republican Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, issued this warning on Tuesday. The world is watching. Uh, they're seeing a dysfunctional democracy. This is what um, the Ayatollah wants. Iran is what uh, Chairman Xi, when he talks about to the present side of Taiwan, that democracy doesn't work. And we need to prove him wrong. And we need to get a speaker by Wednesday. Congressman Nancy Mace is making enemies within the Republican caucus for turning her back on Kevin McCarthy and joining Matt Gates in voting to fire McCarthy last Tuesday. May says she is taking a lot of abuse within the party for betraying the ex-speaker, and she says the abuse is tinged with sexism. Gee, you think? You're a Republican. Of course it's tinged with sexism. You're lucky that's all it is with the Republican Party. So to combat the sexism and to draw attention to herself, Mace walked around the Capitol Tuesday wearing the scarlet letter, an A, which in Nathaniel Hawthorne's book stood for adultery, but I'm going to assume in Nancy Mace's book, it stands for a-hole. I'm wearing the scarlet letter after the week that I just had last week, being a woman up here and being demonized for my vote and for my voice. I'm here to let the rest of the world know and the country know I'm on the side of the people. I'm not on the side of the establishment. And I'm going to do the right thing every single time, no matter the consequences, because I don't answer to anybody in D.C. I don't answer to anyone in Washington. I only answer to the people. Thank you. She only answers to the people unless the people want their student loans forgiven or the people uh, don't want to have to work for food stamps, in which case she only answers to the people who have a lot of money and don't want to pay taxes. You don't answer to the people. But thanks for making this all about you, Nancy Mace. Ukraine, Israel, the eviction crisis, but let's all watch you in a scarlet letter, a T-shirt, because your feelings have been hurt. As I said earlier, Tuesday evening, Republican members of the House met behind closed doors and listened to Louisiana Congressman Majority Leader Steve Scalise and Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee Jim Jordan, who failed his bar exam. They listened as the two of them made their case for speaker. 
Former Speaker Kevin McCarthy was in attendance. Now, the day before, on Monday, he held a 30-minute press conference outlining his five-point plan to solve the Middle East, because apparently solving the Middle East is easier than fixing the Republican caucus. McCarthy on Monday said he was open to becoming Speaker again, but on Tuesday evening, he saw how flat that press conference landed with the Republican caucus and told fellow members, please, please don't nominate me, to which they said, not a problem. But who knows? Scalise and Jordan have a lot of baggage, and it'll be interesting to see if they can elect a speaker today. Remember Matt Gates? He's the guy who caused all this. Before entering Tuesday evening's big caucus with the Republicans, Gates said he too is open. He's open to Scalise or Jordan to becoming speaker, but he didn't endorse either one because they probably asked them him not to, right? They don't need his kiss of death. Gates said he would be willing to negotiate a House rules package that raised the number of members required to bring a motion to vacate the chair from one to possibly as high as 10. In exchange, Gates reached across the aisle and cited Democrat Ro Khanna's proposal to defang the lobbyists. I think that the motion to vacate is negotiable, but it's negotiable for things that are going to make uh, representatives in Washington more responsive. My colleague Ro Khanna laid out a series of reforms that would, uh, I think, you know, limit the influence of lobbyists and special interests here. And so I would be willing to limit my own influence, my own ability to bring a motion to vacate uh, by myself, if it meant at the same time we could reduce the influence of some of the most corrupt enterprises that I think have strangled our nation. Boy, is there an ethics committee hearing waiting for this guy? Learn, read up on the Mann Act. He is going to pay a huge price from the ethics committee because of the problems he has created. As I said, it's down to Scalise and Jordan with McCarthy as a possible wild card. Steve Scalise said he's confident the caucus will have a new speaker by the end of today. And it all starts at 9 a.m. Wednesday. In a few hours, the entire Republican caucus will convene behind closed doors and hold their first round of secret ballots. Supposedly, the consensus is we don't take a nominee to the floor for a full House vote unless the caucus knows it has the requisite 217 votes beforehand. Like I said, the last thing they want is a repeat of last January when McCarthy went 15 rounds before winning. All it takes is five Republicans in that room not to make it unanimous. What do you think? Will we have a speaker by tonight? Leave a comment. Will we even have a vote tonight? New York Congressman George Santos is already under indictment, and on Tuesday he was handed 10 superseding indictments. The new criminal counts accuse him of stealing credit card numbers from <laughs> Sorry. You know, the news has just been so sad and depressing. And then, do we really want to get rid of George Santos? Don't we need him? The new criminal counts accuse George Santos of stealing credit card numbers from the people who donated to his campaign and then making purchases for himself while running up charges that were tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, if you donate to George Santos, weren't you like implicitly giving him permission to use your credit card to go to TJ Maxx and buy stuff? I don't know. Santos already faces criminal charges for embezzling from his campaign. Yeah, but it's been fun. We're going to miss him. Former Congressman Tom Swoozy, who held Santos' seat until he retired in 2022 to run for governor of New York, announced that he is now officially a candidate, a Democratic candidate, to replace Santos in the 2024 election, or, God forbid, 
if Santos is forced to step down and elections are held to replace him. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. left the Democratic Party on Monday and announced he would mount a third party run for president. In one day, Kennedy's super PAC raked in $11 million. That's a lot of money. Kennedy was initially seen as a spoiler in the general election for Joe Biden, but new polling shows he's more likely to hive off votes from Donald Trump as Kennedy moves further to the right on issues like medical freedom and government interference in our lives. Kennedy is scheduled to speak later this month at CPAC in Las Vegas, a sign that he's dipping deeper into the red pool. Trump has already begun attacking him. Meanwhile, Kennedy has reached out to Elon Musk for support. Elon Musk is the wealthiest man in the world, and Jeff Bezos is close. He founded Amazon by destroying Main Street and unions, and to kind of, as an indulgence, to buy his way into heaven, Jeff Bezos purchased the Washington Post nearly a decade ago. And to Bezos's credit, the paper has gotten better because he's left it alone. Bezos said he thought buying the paper would protect American journalism. And with an unlimited checking account, we were all led to believe money was no object. But on Tuesday, the Washington Post announced another round of cutbacks. This is not the first time there have been cutbacks at the Washington Post under Bezos's ownership. 240 jobs at the Washington Post will be slashed. Not all of them are in the newsroom. This is going on as newspapers around the country shudder and journalists find it increasingly difficult to earn a steady paycheck, which is exactly what oligarchs like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk want. Some of you might remember Don Blankenship, who was a coal executive. He was convicted of a misdemeanor after a tragic mine explosion took place under his leadership. He is not a felon. It looked like he was going to be a felon, but the jury ruled differently. When he ran for Senate in West Virginia, his slogan was, I'm not a felon. When he ran for Senate in West Virginia, several news organizations referred to him as a felon. And after he lost the election, he sued those news organizations for libel because he said, I'm not a felon. I was convicted of uh, a misdemeanor. Didn't people die? Well, well what's the, anyway. Uh, so he sued several news organizations because they referred to him as a felon. He sued them for libel. A lower court threw the case out. They, they ruled against him. They said the news organizations did not intend malice when they referred to him as a felon. And he appealed his case to the Supreme Court, which on Tuesday refused to take it. They upheld the lower court, court ruling. In a concurring opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas said Blankenship's case did not reach the level of libel. But then Clarence Thomas said he was willing to go on a fishing expedition for a case that would overturn New York Times versus Sullivan, which for decades has served as an almost blanket protection for the American press, where reporters can write the news without fear of getting sued for libel. Judge Thomas, much like Donald Trump, wants to make it easier to sue news organizations for false statements, for mistakes. On Tuesday, Thomas wrote that New York Times versus Sullivan allows media organizations and public interest groups to cast false, false aspersions on public figures with near impunity, mm, like ProPublica reporting about your hundreds of thousands of dollars in free vacations. See, people like Thomas or Donald Trump are all in on freedom of speech when it comes to saying bad things about the LGBTQ community or black people, Arabs. Uh, but when it comes to journalists, they're all in on 
the cancel culture. Don't be surprised if Donald Trump sues Forbes magazine for leaving him out of their annual list of the 400 richest people. Trump on Tuesday insisted he belonged on the list and accused the magazine of conspiring with, quote, the racist New York State Attorney General, Letitia James. Letitia James's civil suit against Donald Trump entered its second week on Tuesday. Trump has already lost most of this case after the judge two weeks ago ruled from the bench that Donald Trump inflated the value of his properties by hundreds of millions of dollars in order to secure loans from banks. The judge, therefore, found him guilty of fraud and ordered Trump to surrender his business license and place all his New York shell companies into receivership so they could be dissolved. The judge ordered Trump to turn over his properties by this week. But then he granted Trump a waiver on Friday, saying that Trump is going to appeal this decision so it's better for the appeals court to force his companies into receivership. On Tuesday, Trump's former chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, he was working for Trump, I think, a year ago, finally left because he had to go to prison. Uh, Alan Weisselberg, Trump's former chief financial officer, took the stand and admitted that over the years he authorized financial documents that listed Trump Tower by as much as three times what it was worth. Weisselberg testified that Trump was aware he was doing this, but couldn't quite remember if Trump signed off on the final documents. Weisselberg served 100 days at Rikers Island this year for tax fraud. During testimony, he said since he was released from Rikers, he suffers from insomnia and has been prescribed Valium by his psychiatrist a psychiatrist he just started to see. It's too bad he didn't see that shrink decades ago before deciding to work for Fred Trump and his idiot son. Wasselberg is in his late 70s. He is both a witness for the prosecution in this trial as well as a defendant. In other words, he's partially flipped. The more valuable his testimony, the less likely he'll do more prison time. In the civil fraud trial in New York, the judge slapped Donald Trump with a gag order last week, warning him to stop attacking the people who work inside the courtroom. Trump obeyed that order. Later this week, special counsel Jack Smith and Trump's attorneys will go before Judge Tanya Chutkin in a Washington, D.C. courtroom to argue Smith's motion to issue a gag order preventing Trump from talking about the 2020 presidential election interference trial. On Tuesday, Smith filed a motion asking the judge to protect the identity of prospective jurors in the case, warning Trump has a record of intimidation. Smith says he worries for their physical safety. Special Counsel Smith is asking that the jurors during the voir dire process, that's when the attorneys are picking jurors. During that process, the jurors, prospective jurors, fill out written questionnaires instead of appearing in person. And instead of their names, they should be assigned numbers. This level of intimidation, unprecedented. Smith also filed a motion wanting to know if Trump's attorneys are going to mount an, ad mount an advise of counsel defense. It's called an advice of counsel defense. I'll explain what that is. Smith has reason to believe that Donald Trump is going to claim that everything he did to interfere with the 2020 presidential election was because he was given faulty advice by his attorneys, Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Kenneth Cheesebro, Jenna Ellis, and Sidney Powell. Smith, in Tuesday's motion, said that 25 key witnesses in his case have refused to testify, claiming attorney-client privilege. In other words, someone like Rudy can try to claim that what he saw and what he heard is privileged because Donald Trump was his client. But if Trump mounts the bad lawyering defense then those 25 witnesses who refuse to testify will not be able to claim attorney-client privilege because what they told Trump 
is germane to his defense. On Tuesday, Fawny Willis, the Fulton County District Attorney, trying Trump and 18 other co-defendants in a racketeering case surrounding their effort to reverse the 2020 presidential election results in Georgia, she filed a motion early Tuesday asking that Alex Jones, the host of InfoWars, and the chair of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, be forced to testify, file, testify in the trial of Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell, which starts on the 23rd of this month. Cheesebro and Powell are two of Trump's lawyers and are co-defendants in the RICO trial. They asked for a speedy trial and they're entitled to one. So it starts in, what, October 23rd? So that's what, uh, what is that, 12 days away? Uh, Alex Jones said there was no way he would testify in this case. But late Tuesday, Scott McAfee the presiding judge in the case, granted the request and has ordered Ronna McDaniels and Alex Jones to testify. In his ruling, Judge McAfee said Alex Jones was a material witness since Kenneth Cheesebro accompanied Jones as Jones whipped up the mob on January 6 outside the Capitol. He also ruled that Ronna McDaniel, as chair of the Republican National Committee, was familiar with the memos written by Cheesebro outlining the phony elector scheme. According to the January 6th report, Ronna McDaniel, she's the, still the head of the Republican National Committee, assisted Trump and his lawyers in finding phony electors in several swing states. On Tuesday, Fawny Willis also challenged Kenneth Cheesebro's motion to throw out as evidence his memos outlining the phony elector scheme. Cheesebro claimed they were protected by attorney-client privilege. Last week, Cheesebro's attorneys filed a motion to suppress the emails claiming the government didn't use a proper warrant when they seized them from his email account. Kenneth Cheesebro does not want his memos entered into evidence. Since we're in Atlanta, police officer Corinne Kimbrough was fired on Tuesday for tasing a 62-year-old black church deacon who later died. Johnny Holman died last August after the cop arrived on the scene of a minor fender bender and tased him to death. Olivia Troy, who served as Vice President Mike Pence's Homeland Security Advisor, told ABC on Tuesday that Donald Trump privately ridiculed his supporters. Troy said Trump would make fun of the people who showed up at his rallies. He would make fun of them for donating to his campaign or purchasing any of the products his idiot children were selling. Troy also said that Peter Navarro, Trump's economic advisor, found guilty of contempt of Congress last month. She said that Peter Navarro got physically violent with her. Troy said Navarro grabbed her arm forcefully to take some documents from her and that she was not the only woman in the Trump White House that Navarro got rough with. She said, quote, he has the violence in him. Troy added that whenever Navarro disagreed angrily with a woman staffer, he often found a way to call her a prostitute. What are these, like, five-year-olds? Well, dangerous five-year-olds. On Tuesday, five women sued Tim Ballard for sexual assault. Ballard is a former Homeland Security agent who founded Operation Underground Railroad that purportedly rescues children from human trafficking. He quit the organization amid allegations of sexual impropriety. Ballard has become a beloved figure in the conservative Christian movement. His movie, based on the exploits of him tracking down and saving young people from human trafficking. The movie is called Sound of Freedom, and it is one of the highest grossing independent films of all time. QAnon calls it the feel-good movie of the year. Every one of them is completely full of shit. All these people on the right, they are completely full of shit. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong 
and protect the weak. 